Uh, if I don't text you first, and if, I might not have everybody's text, but I, I'm gonna probably gonna shoot a text out to folks to just get an idea of who's gonna be coming and when for family camp. Uh, so, and then also, uh, we, you know, I know that uh, I think uh, Caleb's gonna be uh, doing some cooking, but he's probably gonna need some assistance. So we'll probably look at some, uh, who would like to help on, on the different days for some assistance for him. So I might uh, throw some probes out for that too, out there to see who's ready for that. Other than that, uh, there he goes, right around the corner. So I'm gonna be, we get that starting to raise right now. Uh, and uh, get some maps remade up. I always have my little maps um, set up. So any other things going on that I'm not aware of? Don't know. All right. Uh, Father God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the time now to come to worship you in the Word. And uh, Father, I just pray that you would just uh, touch our hearts with your truth. And uh, uh, Lord, just let it wiggle its way in there. Uh, and let it just do its work to change our lives, change our hearts, change our perspective. And I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a lot of times folks that will uh, uh, come to a Sunday morning and you expect the pastor to uh, uh, beat you up with some moral lesson or anything like that. Well, uh, let me tell you today, today you will not get like some moral lesson. This morning as, as we were praying about it, just thinking about it, I, I just get the, the opportunity to just brag about God. Just bragging about God, which is just because really when we worship, we worship in song, we worship in fellowship. And really this is a part of worship too, to worship in the Word. And so as I, said, as I was thinking about it, like, man, I don't have any like definitive, like, okay, this lesson means this for us today as far as like some life lesson kind of idea. But... It does. This lesson is going to talk to us about the goodness of God, and I. That comes from Santa's brain this morning. Santa's prayer on this was just so good. I was like, man, I'm just chalk, chalk, chalk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So thank you, thank you for you guys' prayers. Thank you for all the prayers for our Sunday mornings. It's just uh, you get out of your prayers, you know, what you pray for for this time together, and. Uh, as I, you know, as I was looking at, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, day two and day three, and uh, it's when you think of creation, it's, it's relatively the account is easy to understand. It really is. The biggest thing is when you begin to start thinking about what is happening. That's when it's like astounding to contemplate, like what is going on. It's like it's easy to say, oh yeah, I had my house built, but. If, if I went out there and tried to build a house, I'd be like lost. I'd be like, oh yeah, give me a nail. And I can maybe nail this one, but you better tell me every little place where it's got to go. Otherwise, I'm going to mess it up. You know, you better show me this because that's how, that what looks so simple is really a system, a complicated system. And so that we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But one thing to also keep in mind when we think about this creation account is something that many people have uh, came up with. There's a fancy term now for it among the scientists that are scratching their heads trying to figure things out. It's called the anthropomorphic principle. In other words, the anthro, the idea of people, and uh, pomorphic is like the idea of, of like forming into an image of creation. In other words, they look at everything. They've looked at our planet and where it's positioned in our galaxy, in our solar system, and our galaxy, in the universe, like everything seems to point back at this planet. Like somehow everything was made for this place and for our existence. And that's, that's fascinating to consider. You know, it's like, wow. You know, of course, you know, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, humanity could be arrogant about that. We didn't make the decision for that. We're just noticing what we see. Yeah. If this is what it looks like. It is. Now again, God may correct us in the end, but it sure does. The observations that we're making 
sure do point in this direction. On that note, let's read Genesis 1 through 5, or chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, to get us going again. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And in verse 3, God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now let's dive into the second day. And he's about to do something with all that water that's on the surface. Genesis 1, 6. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. Then he like the uh, he says what he says, but then it says exactly the same thing of what he does. And in verse 7, it says, And God made the expanse and separated the waters and there that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. So here it's talking about this expanse. Uh, King James uh, uses an older English term, the firmament. So if you got that, you might have that word in there. It's, a, it's a, just a fancy description of the formation of the atmosphere of the air. Forming it, uh, uh, separating uh, uh, the, the waters that were on the surface and putting some type, type of water up in the sky. And I think I have a picture there. There's the atmosphere. Um, now, it's just the, when it talks about the waters above the expanse, so here's this expanse of so the, the picture there you see of the, the clouds up above and the sea down below. It's got the, it's just a it's very, the waters up above, just a technically, I like to use it, I thought, how do I say this? It's a technically simple term of describing the water vapor and the atmosphere. Now, we don't know much about how much water vapor was there. Uh, there are some that have suggested, as the creation scientists, as they've tried to understand this, they propose the idea of like a whole water canopy. That is like, some people are questioning that idea, uh, whether or not there would be this whole water canopy up there. Uh, because, and then what they suggested, it was like, it was like real water up there, and then this was protecting the earth from different UV rays and other stuff. But as the science has approved, they were like, well, even if that was there, it wouldn't necessarily do what they're thinking that it's proposing. So most likely, it was just, it was water vapor that was up there, the clouds that we see. Uh, but we don't know how dense it was. These, so there's a lot of things we just don't know, which is okay. We just don't know what was there. Uh, yet, we should consider what we know today about the amount of water in the clouds in the atmosphere at any one time. I got this next slide. There's 37.5 million billion gallons of water in the sky right now. Ever thought about that? And I got that's how many zeros I've ever thought about that. A lot of gallons. It's just to me. I remember the first time I ever heard the idea that a cloud. We just see a cloud out there. How much water is in that cloud? Just the millions of gallons that are just in one cloud. Of course, that, 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 this comes to the astounding part. How is it still up there? And of course, the, the, the physics and stuff, the, you know, how the, the density and the vapor floating and all that stuff. Of course, that's why it rains. You know, somebody talked to us even this morning. We had the deluge of rain just this morning. Well, there it was. It condensed up together, and it just couldn't stay up there that much longer. It had to come down. Um, but it's amazing. It says, that's what we have today. That's what we know is there. So we don't know how much, if there was more water vapor in the sky at that time or less. We don't know. Because that's uh, a tr reason that why people have that question is they're thinking about the blood, of course, that we're going to see in, in chapter 6, 7, and 8 of the Bible for Noah's flood. Like, where did all that water come from? So they suggest it's, it's possible. We just don't know them. But I have some other possibilities on that when we come to that. Um, God gives this expanse a name in Genesis 1 8. It says, God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And when he talks about heaven, of course, that's the, that's the word that they can use for sky, uh, the abode, the firmament, the air, stars. It's kind of used for a lot of different terms. 
But the heaven that they're referring to is not the heaven where God lives, okay? That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about something else. It's just a fancy way or another way of referring to the atmosphere. But when you go through the Bible, the Bible actually seems to, in their explanation of things and their cultural understanding of stuff, they, they talk about like the idea of three different heavens, if you will, three different descriptions. So just like we can have one word that has three different meanings or multiple meanings, well, they, they have the same thing. So let's take a look at a couple different ones. The first heaven is what we're talking about today, the earth's atmosphere. Uh, Deuteronomy 11.11 11 talks about this. But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks the water by the rain from heaven. So there it is. It's just the regular atmosphere that we have there. So that's what's going on. Uh, the second is uh, interplanetary or interstellar space. In Psalms 8.3, it says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your finger, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. So they're, they're talking about everything that's way out there. You know, those heavens. Uh, they all, that just stretch and stretch and go as far as what we could possibly ever imagine. Uh, but then there's the third heaven, if you will. And this is a heaven that refers to where God lives. Uh, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 27 says, then the priests and the Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came to his holy habitation in heaven. There they're talking about God, where God lives. This other place, this, is, this other abode, this is like the sky, expansive. So they, that's why they use the same word. Paul talked about this. He said that one time, and he, he talked about where he says he's referring to some other guy, but everybody's pretty much sure it's him. So like there was a time when Paul got beaten up so much so that he was killed. And he said this guy was taken up to the third heaven. And he saw things that were inexpressible and he couldn't, he couldn't even repeat again. He just said, this was, I saw things I couldn't describe. And so there was, so he was, this third heaven is, is where God abides. So and, uh, our verse ended with the uh, last part of 8. It, Verse 8, where it says, and there was evening, and there was morning, and the second day. Now, all you astute Bible students might already notice that it doesn't say that what he did on the second day was good. It doesn't mention anything. It doesn't even say. So, some have suggested, well, why didn't he say something that this was good? Well, it's possible that the work was connected. So, what he was doing on the second day is also going to overlap into the third day. Besides, that kind of gives us credence because we find out on the third day that we get two goods on the third on the third day. So there we go. So let's get to the third day. So that first understanding of heaven we just talked about is born out with the verse 9. Uh, Genesis 1, 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. That is, we're told again that he just repeats himself of what God does. He says it, then he does it. Uh, verse 10 it says, God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Pretty straightforward. The word earth means firm or ground, <laughs> just like that. I'm, I'm on solid earth, if you will. The sea is kind of interesting. Kind of kick a guess if you haven't looked at, peeked at your, your uh, word dictionary. The word seas from Hebrew, you won't have to remember the Hebrew word. But what do you think the word seas, where they would have got it from? What do you, what's your best guess? Best, the, the word seas, they use the word for roar. Which is kind of interesting, because every time you run the ocean, it just, there's a lot of noise there. Just so much noise, and so there you go. So the word for roar is the same word they use for seas. And so it is, and again, uh, everything that's happening is this, this creation order. It's all pointing to every little step is towards life. And it's a, some folks have tried to figure out, like everybody, they always try to figure these things out. How did the dry land appear? There are some that actually believe, and it's possible, this is possible, I don't know, uh, they suggest that all the waters, that God just took the H2, the hydrogen and the oxygen, and somehow made all the dirt. And it, that's possible. I don't know. I don't think so, though. Um, 
seemed to me the easier possibility is that God just took the, the dirt, the crust that was underneath, the, the rocks and everything else, and just pushed things up, pushed it out of the, out of the ocean, and that's why we had the ocean valleys and everything that's there. Um, now, the, the other question that everybody runs into, again, that we don't know, is was it all the, the different continents, or was it one continent? Now, everybody, when they look at the map, when you look at the map and you push all the land pieces together, they all fit together like a puzzle. They really do. Everybody just generally, it's like, wow. So, in my mind, hey, it's entirely possible that it was all one land mass at the time. Which is always interesting because even the, all the paleontologists, the dinosaur guy, all suggest that this land that they call Pangea, is what they, they name it, was the continent. So, possible. You know, just like they just are still discovering what God knew all along. You know, and so there it is. But again, we don't know how big that land mass was or anything like that. We just don't know. Uh, uh, but as always, Whenever we can see the world today, the world today is not the world that was before the flood. So everything, the, the, the landscape, the type of animals that were there, that's something to keep in mind. So we're going to talk about kinds today in just a little bit. Uh, but all that we see are what left of the kind of animals that Noah took with him. And how those different kinds of animals developed after that. The trees, everything, might be drastically different than what was there before the flood. Just so, so we just can't even imagine it. It's just the, the different how they would have adapted, because that's what they do, that God created them to do so. How they adapted then to how they adapted after the flood can be two different things. How they adapted. It's just interesting to think about. So dry land appears. Now life begins. And what God chooses is life is plants. Because think about it, plants just need just light, water, dirt, and the right kind of music, and you have to talk to them really nice. Oh, okay, maybe God did that. I don't know. But I, it's always funny when you think about that, how plants like to respond to our speech. Uh, speaking of that, in verse 11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. Then again, he just said, there it is, and what he does. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit, which there is their seed, and according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. There it is. Uh, it's just like it's good. He already said that the, you know, the land coming out was good. This is good. Remember, that means it's proper, it's, it has beauty, it's just like this is good stuff. Um, it's just interesting to think about. He says that he let the earth sprout vegetation, and, and the next, in verse 12, he uses the idea of brought forth vegetation. God made bio machines that self replicate, rocks don't reproduce. Dirt, you can stir it around all you want, it's, it's not going to reproduce dirt. It's just dirt. It might change its form, but it's not reproducing. God made something that could reproduce. Organic materials. It's just amazing he did that. Of course, he chooses plants first for a couple different reasons. We'll come to them in a second. But... He made, it says that, I, I kind of looked and maybe there's like three different types of plant life. He talks about vegetation. This is a, a very, the word for vegetation pretty much means sprout like grass. So grass, you know, so thus salad was born right then. There it is. We got salad, plants yielding seed. Now this was, a, the word is almost the same. It's like it's grain and seeds kind of going together. It's like grass with seeds. So I don't know if it's talking about oats, barley, something different than the grass before. I have no idea. Don't know if one was a little bit more leafy than the other. I don't know. All I know is the first one was talks about sprouts, and that's why we put sprouts on our salad. The alfalfa sprouts, and all the bean sprouts. It's all from there, okay? But then it also has fruit, spree, fruit trees. Fruit speaks for itself. Vitamin C, baby. you got to have that. So all that's there ready to go. 
all these different fruit trees. We don't even know what kind of fruit trees. I, I, that was one of the interesting things when I was overseas, you know, when I was on the carrier, and they would bring in food from the local sources. They would just, there would be crates of fruit of different kinds, but you would look at them and it's like, what kind of fruit is that? And because it was not the same as what we would produce over here. But it was still like an orange that didn't quite look like an orange. An apple that didn't quite look like the apple that we would expect, but it was still an apple. But it was amazing the different kinds that were there, the different kinds of fruit that existed. So plants, they were done first because they were essential for food. Got to have, you know, gotta have the, the buffet table ready before you bring all the other stuff coming down the line. Got to have that ready to go. Because you think it's not just on dry land. You think about all the seaweed, all that other stuff, all the all the algae, everything. That's all part of the plant family. Everything, all these different things that would, were needed to exist. Uh, plants, they clean, help start to clean up the oxygen. Because imagine if you brought all the other the animals without plants. Because then the, the plants take our CO2 that we exhale and clean it up for us to produce more oxygen. So you've got to have plants first. And then also, you know, plants have their role in helping to, uh, one element, if you will, because there's a lot of elements involved in cleaning up the atmosphere, regulating the Earth's temperature. It's all part of that. It's one part of the role in doing that. It's just amazing that, that that's, that's their role. Uh, and that's what he did. Now he introduced a key phrase, and I kind of mentioned this already, Genesis 1.12b, where it says, each according to its kind. Okay, so this, this is an interesting statement. This comes up again, especially with the other animals, but then when we get to Noah's Ark, and the animals that he takes, and he says, two by two by their kind. So we have to understand that, because you know, a lot of people are like, how did Noah get all those animals in there? Well, he didn't take every animal. He took the high-level animals. The, 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 and that's what this is. It's like a, a high-level, uh, entry-level kind of plants that were started uh, that would produce similar plants down the line. So you'd have one particular plant and then produce more. Again, and there you got a, couldn't find pictures of plants, sorry. So we had to deal with the cat. So, uh, so here it is, of course. There is one kind of cat, if you will, but a cat produces all these other different different kinds of, of cats, but they're all from a cat. This has been shown to, you know, when they take a whole bunch of dogs together and interbreed them together, do you know what you get? You get wolves. You would, when they put several dog breeds together and have them interbreed, they go right back to where they were before. They become wolves. They do this all the time with germs. Whenever they're trying, you know, like, of course, we're very familiar with pandemics, you know, and, uh, <laughs> but the main idea when they're trying to study a germ or a bacteria or virus, the virus that we see is, is a virus that's several generations beyond what it was originally. So what they do is they interbreed several of the same kind of viruses together to bring the original virus. That's how they do it. So everything is, they run, they understand this principle. They totally understand it. It goes right back to the kind, again, of what it was. And then, then they can use that then to go forward to try to produce the vaccines, whatever they want to do, or combat a particular virus, or to use it for something else. And so this kind is like, it's a genetic boundary statement. So another, uh, one kind of plant is not going to become another kind of plant. An apple tree has several, several, hundred, probably hundreds of varieties of apples that are out there. But as much as you plant apple trees, you're never going to get an orange from that apple tree. The only way to do it is to splice a branch in there. And I don't even know if that will work between the orange and an apple. But that's the whole idea. You're just going to continue just to get an apple tree. And that is what they've seen in science. Probably the biggest thing, again, is all these evolutionary guys to try to find out how evolution happened. They, they use viruses. The best one, I think, is the E. coli virus. They put it in the Petri dish, and they just keep re reproducing different generation, generation, because I guess their generations happen almost like every minute. You know, So they're able to just try to produce this to try to see, did evolution happen? 
Did that E. coli become an Ebola virus or something like that? And it hasn't. Even though they introduced different ideas to try to change it, it'll adjust for a second, but then go back to what it was. So it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't mutate to become some other kind of virus. It stays the virus that it was. And that's what they've discovered. And so, that in mind, this statement, the idea of being kind, is also a scope statement. So we have a boundary statement. This is the kind that it's going to be, but the scope of what's happening here. The scope of how many plants he made. There was all still, even though we're like talking about limited down to a certain kind, but a lot of kinds are made. All in one day. It's just amazing to think about the scope that began that day. Again, uh, verse 12 and 13, and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. So now, before we conclude this morning, I'd like to note something about this life that God created. Something that, you know, our young folks here that are still in school, they're going to encounter uh, evolutionists, they get either your friends or other folks are going to tell you, oh yeah, everything involved. And it's just chance happenings make it happen. There's a huge problem with that, though, and that's called complexity. Complexity that's there. So let's take a look at that. I have a definition there. Uh, complexity is the quality of being intricate or compound. So in other words, it's not simple. It's got some intricate stuff in there. It's like you take apart a watch or take apart a circuit card, it's complex. Especially like nowadays, if you were to take a microscope, even to just a, a motherboard chip, all the things going on there is very intricate, very complicated. And uh, of course, they even say that doesn't even come close to like the complicated buildings of like the human mind or any brain, if you will. So the idea that when we talk about complexity, is we have to realize that God created what God created was instantly complex and irreducibly complex. So instantly complex and irreducibly complex. It was instantly complex. God created these kinds of plants fully ready to go. They weren't partially ready to go. They weren't like trying to get ready to go. They were ready to go. They're ready to do what, what they needed to do. And since, uh, like, you young folks or other folks who play video games or use a computer, the best thing about some things is where it's plug and play. You know, you get a device and it's ready to go. And so in a sense, this creation was plug and play. It was, it was made ready to go. So for evolutionists, this is a major problem. Because in their idea, everything, the, the, the move from just the very basic rocks and dirt and stuff like that to eventually become life, they have to realize that complexity works against them. When they think about this leap, I got about like six steps that I just kind of thought about my own self, so this is very crude, if you will, as far as like what I thought about. But that's just, I'm just a simple guy, so if I can think of these things, you guys could probably think of even more with this. Here's the first step. First, all the chemicals would have had to somehow combine into the right kind of proteins. Everybody knows the proteins nowadays. It's a high protein diet. Gotta have your high, high, you know, get your keto diet, you the high protein, everything. You know, proteins are those building blocks, that's what starts everything. And even then when they when you develop pro protein, that protein is like because one guy said, oh yeah, that back in the day they had that. Uh, the cosmic goop that was sitting there on the earth and the lightning bolt hit it and immediately that produced some protein. He even has an experiment that he allegedly took the elements and zapped it and he said, oh, I produced a protein. Problem is, you have to produce the right protein. Because the ones he did, there was like, there's what they call a left hand and right hand protein. I can't remember which one's which, but one will produce life and one will not. And the ones he produced it were the one produced were the ones that would not. And even then, these proteins, one day, if you could even begin to put all the puzzle pieces together just to produce a protein, 
You got to make sure it stays together because the atmosphere that he suggested these proteins would be created in would have instantly killed the protein. So he's got a, there it is, he's got a problem. Then again, you still get to put the puzzle pieces together just for that. Second, the proteins would need to fit, need to form into the right kinds of enzymes. Because that's what a protein gets. They all form up together to enzymes. There's like so many different types of enzymes just to get to something else. But that protein doll will have to fit just right. Some enzymes have like a uh, hundred and some on, uh, uh, proteins put together. Some are all, almost like 500 proteins go together to just get an enzyme working. So you imagine, again, uh, my favorite illustration is if I was up here with a quarter and I flipped the quarter and I did heads. And I flipped it again and I did heads again and the heads again and heads again. Pretty soon you'd be like, Robbie, I think you've got a trick coin going on there. Because you would know I'm cheating. Something You just don't keep getting heads every time. The odds again are, uh, for that are just astronomically against it. So when you think about just on this very basic level, just getting to the right enzyme to get all the protein, to get something even the smallest, most simple enzyme of like a hundred some odd proteins, the chances are impossible. Because whenever really they talk about chance and somebody says, oh, this is like, and they use the mathematical term of like, this is like one times 10 to the 50th power or more of a chance. Whenever you get up to that, so you math with is whenever you get something times to the 50th power, it's like 50 zeros back there. Hmm. Statistically, that's impossible. That's, that's when you've reached statistic impossibility. But many times if they talk about there many more zeros beyond that. So it's just impossible to do this by chance, by just random processes. Just is not going to happen. And I haven't even got to step number three yet. Third step: these enzymes would have to assemble to the correct sequence for RNA. Like RNA, you've heard of DNA, but RNA is the step before you get to DNA. RNA is ribonucleic acid. It's a one strand of all these enzymes put together. And it's like they've discovered that, you know, they thought RNA had a, no purpose. But they've discovered that the RNA is the message bearer to the DNA. It's like a little courier, if you will. So now think about that. Not only have you have to, had to figure out the right, how to build the enzymes by chance. Now you have to get all the right enzymes to put together to do this particular RNA strand that's going to produce information for the DNA. Where did it get the information? How did it decide? How could it just, I love it, always love it on the show. Mother Nature decided, what? <laughs> Load of garbage. <clears throat> it's just like, nature just doesn't decide these things. There's just no way. Again, the, you're stacking up the odds more and more against life. And that's just the RNA. The RNA, remember, that's one strand. Now it goes to the fourth step. The RNA would have to communicate the sequence to form a DNA. That's what everybody talks about. Our, you know, everything. We're all made of DNA. Everything. Bugs. Plants. All has DNA in it of some kind. But it took all the different RNA to figure out how to do that. And then not only that, they had to put it all together and figure out how to put it together in such a way that it would stay together. You realize the DNA strands forever want to go apart, except for the right proteins that keep it all together. And there's only four different pro proteins that put together a DNA strand. But they all have to be put together just right to form one of us or a form of plant. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. And that's just the DNA. That's his fourth thing. Five, the DNA would have to have a direction to make all the different functions for just a single cell. Again, they're begging, it's like, I always love Frank Turek's book. Frank Turek has a book called Stealing from God. 
Because that's in a sense what they're doing. They're stealing from God. It's like all this stuff happens. It's just like some undirected purpose. But then they'll like act like it has direction. And the only way to do that is to steal from God. And pretend that, that nature by itself just has this wondrous, supernatural whatever to be able to do something like this. But again, no, it would have to have information. That's why I, I love uh, the book Signature of the Cell by Stephen Meyer. Uh, just a great, great book. Just talking about DNA almost the whole time. How they discovered it, how they figured it out, and all that stuff. Just a lot of great science details uh, that point, and, and from a creationist kind of perspective, uh, Stephen Meyer, but Stephen Meyer, one of his expertise is information technology. Let's face it, we all have cell phones, just about smartphones, all those things, all the, like if we're playing a video game, all those things put together, all that information is put together on purpose for you to be able to play a video game, even on your phone, or to send a text message. All the ones and zeros that go into just a simple text message to get there, it's, it's a lot of information that goes behind every letter. Is there? Where did that information come from? If I just like tried to send Gabriel a text, and I'm just like, did it just hit the keys like that? And here, Gabe and hit send. Gabe gets this bunch of gobbledygook in there. I'm like, what's this? What? You, don't you understand that information? It's like, no, it's got to be put together into something that's intelligent, which for me can be a challenge. But you know, there it is. You know, put this information to him. But in order to convey a message, in order to get something done, I have to be able to tell him, hey, let's get pizza. Otherwise, if I interpret it, it's like, let's get tacos, which would be okay. Yeah, I'm with that, but you know, I've got to convey the, the proper information. And that's the problem. There's just, in all of this, it's all information that had to come from, that's why the intelligent design community is, who is not necessarily creationist, not necessarily Christian, but they see that behind everything there appears to be intelligence, which we are all like, yeah, <laughs> like God is behind this to make it happen. I even got to number six. Number six, the cells would need a way, all these things that, to process other proteins in order to energize the process. In other words, they got to have all this stuff. And it's just like, I could have put a picture up there, just the idea of just a cell. Just how much is in it. Just an uh, just amazing amount of a cell. It's like its own factory. And it can produce, you ever think about it, a cell, when it produces, it's not just producing one part of the cell. It's like going out there to see, you know, where the lumber yard is at, and watching one day, sitting back with the popcorn, and watching the whole lumber yard shake, rattle and roll, and all of a sudden there's another lumber yard right next to it. Fully ready to function. That's what happened. When a cell splits apart, which is amazing that it would, could do that, make another cell that can do everything that the other cell just did. And have all the parts ready to go. How did it do that? Amazing. Amazing stuff. Now, remember I said this is all instantly made. It was all instantly complex. All those six things that I just came, came up with were instantly done. But they were also irreducibly complex or irreducible complexity. This principle describes what we observe in nature as the chicken or the egg on steroids. Okay? That's always the question. Which came first, chicken or egg? And of course, as, as a creationist, both. Both chickens. The, the, the hen and the rooster were both produced right out the gate. They had to be. Same for the different kind of plants. So I have a definition for irreducible complexity here. We have a definition done by the guy who's really put it forward. His name is Michael Behe. Uh, really set forth with this principle. A system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function 
wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. Well, you're like, man, that's a pretty fancy thing. Well, how do we know what that is? Mousetrap, which is the one he used. You see a mousetrap there, and many people have used one to get those little crazy critters. Well, you gotta have all these parts in order for a mousetrap to work. If you tried to have all that springs and stuff without a platform, it wouldn't be able to have the leverage to do what it would do to catch anything. Gotta have the little holding bar. Otherwise, that little the catch there that's sitting there wouldn't catch anything. And once again, you wouldn't be able to set the spring. Gotta have the hammer. Otherwise, that little mouse printer isn't gonna get me. It's gonna bite the big one. It'll just get away. It'll just steal the cheese or the peanut butter, whatever you put on there, it'll get away. So all these different parts have to be there, ready to roll in order to use it. It's irreducibly complex. So obviously a complex machine, and of course, that's the thing, everybody wants to build a better mousetrap, but they need to have all these components in order to work. Irreducibly complex. But then we have another machine, human eye. And again, as we were talking about this the other day, the human eye is not even the most complex eye in the, in, in the, in the animal created kingdom, if you will. But there it is, all these things that have to be present for an eye to have any kind of meaningful information. You know, you have to, you have, to have a lens already to work, so that, it, and not only a lens that allows light through, but a lens that can move and focus. Otherwise, it would just be, we'd just have a blur. You gotta have all those, all those fancy words for the stuff in the back of the optic nerves, gotta be able to transmit that information to the brain, gotta be there, ready to grow. All those different, like it's the phobia, corn, retina stuff, those are all different nerve endings that will receive different bandwidths of light and, and transmit them for us so that we can do that. And then, you know, gotta have the protective eye, you got the eyelid, got a pupil, got all this other stuff, the iris that just lets us know what eye color is. <laughs> yeah. But iris, that helps with the focusing too, allows, it. imagine if your iris didn't work, it would be open all the time, you'd just be blind, blinded, you'd be like, ah, turn off the lights. <laughs> But the iris will close and open to allow just the right amount of light in, and it had to be ready to go. Had to work. There's a semi-legendary story that, that you know, people pass around that Darwin, when he was thinking about evolution, that the eye was one of the things that gave him the most problems. So he's like, how? How? Because when you think about it, the little crawly critters coming through the Mr. Amoeba, it needs an eye, allegedly. Why? But it's got to have it's got to have every component of an eye in order to work. Otherwise, it's like, hey, I got this little lens on me. It's amoeba with a lens in it. Why? Well, this is unneeded. I don't need this. You know, toss the lens. You know, it's done. And that just has no reason. That's the whole thing when they suggest this this ongoing improvement. It's just like. If you only have bits and pieces, it's like, why? Why would it need it? But God created all these things, ready to go. Instantly complex, irreducibly complex. They were, had everything they needed to do, to live, and to reproduce. Amazing stuff. Speaking of bragging on God, I want to celebrate communion. Get to brag on Jesus too, what He did for us. Because when we think about that God created life, I like I like your little quote in here, Sarah. That God created heaven and earth in six days. Who's to say He cannot change your life in one? <laughs> and that is true. Uh, I love that. So let's prepare for communion. Uh, invite the worship team up. And I just hope today, Jesus, we brag on God and His capabilities. When we think of Jesus, the creator who came to die, just, just amazing thought that he would do for us. So Father God, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I just pray, Father, that you would just fill us again. As I prayed even last week, I know I'm repeating prayers about the Lord, that you would just continue just to Fill us with awe and wonder at your creation. Not even the stuff that we can see, but when we consider even the, the, those microscopic 
microscopic items that we just cannot see and, under, and barely getting an understanding of. Lord, it's just amazing. It's all in the details. Lord, you are good. And just pray now, Lord, you prepare our hearts to worship you in this ceremony. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
not only just once, but forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Worship the Lord one more time.